Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us. Today we're talking to Matt Miller, who is Director of Science Communications for the Nature Conservancy. He's also editor of the Cool Green Science blog and the author of the book, Fishing Through the Apocalypse, which I would highly recommend if you're interested in nature or fishing in general. He's also a recipient of the Jade Award, which is the highest conservation writing honor of the Outdoor Writers Association of America. And he's a, listed on uh, the Nature Conservancy, actually the Cool Green Science blog as a lifelong naturalist and outdoor enthusiast. And he's covered stories on science and nature around the globe and is an avid hunter, angler, distance runner, and mammal enthusiast. And Matt, I was kind of disappointed you didn't have avid birder on there, but I guess we'll talk to you anyways. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I always say that I'm a, a birder who doesn't like lists. So I, uh, <laughs> I, I love watching birds, but I, I'm not like a fanatic lister. Someday. Yeah. <laughs> when you run out of other things to do, you'll be like, you know, my life list is looking a little short. <laughs> and then also yeah, yeah. that's the beginning <laughs> so matt how did you end up in the your role as science communicator did you always know science communication was something that you wanted to focus on or did you just kind of end up doing that well I, you know from the time i was very young i wanted to do writing and at the time I, you know i called it outdoor writing or nature writing but i also always had a curiosity and so science was of interest. I actually started as a wildlife biology major. I just happened to be really bad at math. So I went the writing about the wildlife biology results. And that led me um, into delving not only about wildlife, but the science behind it. And that became a bigger and bigger part of the work I wanted to do. And I actually started with the Nature Conservancy working for the Idaho program. And there I just saw that science was integral to conservation. And so when the science communications program launched, um, it was like my dream job by that point. That's awesome. So how do you feel particularly science communication can help promote uh, bird conservation in particular? Well, I, you know, the birding community, I would argue, are the among all outdoor recreationists, the most passionate conservationists. So the interest is already there. And for the Nature Conservancy, the number one interest or hobby of our membership is birding. And so there is this natural affinity. It's how we can connect people to the larger work. So I think when it comes to birds, there are already a lot of people who care about birds already have an interest in science. They may not even call it that, but they want to know why birds do the things they do. You know, very few per people just want to go run up their life list and that's the end of it. They want to take it one step farther in some way. I also think birds are, have a pretty universal appeal. So bird feeding, which I, I separate out from birding, you know, some outdoor recreational studies lump them together, but I think bird feeding is separate. But you could argue that bird feeding is the most popular way people connect with nature in the United States, Europe, and a few other parts of the world. That is true. I feel like a lot of people that we know who are into birds just started like doing stuff at their feeder and then they're like, oh, it's like, I really love my like birds that I have in my yard. And sometimes it stays there, but sometimes it really branches out and gets them into other stuff. Um, out of curiosity, like there's a park that Ryan and I went to where the chickadees are really tame and you're able to like hand feed them. How do you feel about people like hand feeding birds? Do you think that's good for conservation or would you say that like there should be that line? I know you had that article about um, why staying on trail is bad. And Ryan and I both read it and, and we're kind of in agreement that more people should be out playing in nature. But what's your take on that hand feeding bird? You know, I, I think, so it, it, there's a lot of nuance there. You know, I, and it, you know, there are, you will occasionally find a purist who thinks like even feeding birds goes too far, right? Like that it's domesticating birds. And I wouldn't say that. And I think in some instances, like with a chickadee, I don't see any harm. And I think that connection can be pretty powerful. And 
over the years I've had times, not when I was trying to feed birds, but like I've just had birds land on me. One time when I was doing the Great Backyard Bird Count, a goldfinch actually landed on my hat. <laughs> and uh, and I, I've also done things like where I, I one time went out to our hummingbird feeder and I would stand there and I put my finger on the perch and I just waited there until a hummingbird landed on it, which actually didn't, it took like about 10 minutes. So <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think there's something in us that loves like kind of fooling wild animals. And this is a pretty harmless way. That said, you know, in Northern Minnesota, there are tour operators now who are throwing out live mice along roads to get good pictures of owls. And the owls are flying low over the road and they're becoming acclimated to humans. And so in that instance, to me, there is a line. And so like training a predatory bird to associate humans with food or to associate roads with food is obviously not a good thing. Yeah, there's been, there's always been a big debate about the baiting owls thing where, you know, well, I don't know if it's even really been a debate. People are just like, don't do it. <laughs> Well, there's clearly yeah. people out there that think it's okay because it keeps happening. So, you know, and I feel like there's people that are probably just waiting in this conversation to like hit the comment section when it gets released and they're just like, don't feed any birds, don't do anything, don't impact nature. And I wanted to talk a little bit, Matt, about that article you wrote because I think it was really interesting and raised some unique points about how we view conservation right now. Because in that article, you made the point that with people saying, don't go off trail, don't touch anything, don't look, you know, just look and then look at videos of these animals and stuff and don't get involved at all. I feel like it does get to a level of being boring then when you talk about conservation like when you hear conservation you think I'm going to read some books about it I'm going to watch some videos about it and that's it and you made the point that it's very integral to actually be out in the environment and see that stuff for yourself I want to know more about your thoughts on that yeah that that's a great question and I should note that I wrote that essay pre-COVID and so and in some ways this pandemic has more people going outside and it's really putting that idea to the test, like people just pounding some natural areas. And of course that can be a threat, you know, like there's lots of garbage, there's a creek, you know, 20 minutes from my home that was shut down this summer because they needed time to haul out all the garbage. They hauled out three dump truck loads, but it's also an opportunity, right? people want to be out in nature. And so it's finding this balance. But I still think that that connection is so important. Um, there, there's a science fiction novel, and much of it's outdated, but it, it's called Beasts, and it's written by John Crowley. And in it, one of the really interesting ideas are that humans, the humans that are left on Earth, decide they've done enough damage, and they live in a dome and they find a way to be self-sufficient. So they're completely sealed off. But um, one guy is sent out to deal with a lawbreaker and he ends up, that he, he likes it out there. He doesn't want to go back in. And, but I think in, for some environmentalists, like that vision would be aspirational, like where we live in a dome and leave the rest of the world to its devices. And I think I, I'm firmly in the camp that we are a part of this world and it is hard to fight for it or advocate on behalf of wildlife if you haven't had that experience out in nature. Definitely. Something that Ryan and I found interesting is we were talking to a friend of ours, Pat Reddy, about bluebird restoration and we were saying how long do you think people are going to have to keep putting up nest boxes and keep being involved? And he said, as long as um, invasives like the starling and the house bear around, we're probably going to have to do it forever. And just to like, just to like, that was kind of mind blowing. It's like, like forever now we're going to have to assist the bluebird and surviving. Like it was, it was sad, but like, yeah. it's cool that we're able to do stuff to help those species. Yeah, and that, that brings up that pristine nature and what that means, which you know, it, it's probably always been a myth 
um, that there is this nature that is free of human influence. And somehow that's more than a nature that has human influence. But, you know, there are invasive species and some of them can be controlled, but there's no turning back. Like we are going to have invasive species. I, you know, I, I've written a lot about fish and so many of our waters, most of our waters have some non-native fish or another. And yeah, there are some headwater streams that you can protect for native fish, but it isn't like 10 years or 50 years, we're going to have waters free of invasive species. And so how do we balance that? I think that's um, one of the great challenges of conservation. And how do we conserve places that are you know, less than wilderness or less than quote unquote pristine? Yeah, do you have any advice on how to try to prevent some of that invasive species movement? Because with fish, of course, you can contain as much as possible the waterways, but with birds, you have the whole flight aspect. Is there anything that people can do or that like government agencies could do to kind of prevent the spread of invasives? Yeah, that, um, so it's difficult in an era of global trade and just human behavior, but part of it is, I, I think it, brings up a limit of science communication. So there's this idea that like, if we train enough people not to release their pets, we can release that as a vector for invasive species. Because it, that happens with birds, it happens with fish, with reptiles. In places like Florida, it's a major issue. So the idea is we just need to reach enough people. But the problem is if you have one person who dumps an aquarium, you failed in your effort. And so you can never have 100% compliance for something like that. So the point is not education. It's saying that, you know, some fish we should not be keeping as pets and we have to stop them at the border. Even then it can be a challenge, but that's a less daunting challenge than saying anyone who buys this fish has to buy into our education and outreach campaign. Derek, I don't know about you, but that made me think of the Wells catfish story. From, <laughs> uh, I think it was like River Monsters well, or something. Uh, it was Zeb Hogan. <laughs> yeah, it was Zeb yeah. Hogan where he interviewed a guy that was like, yeah, I'm solely responsible for introducing the Wells catfish to all of these ecosystems or one ecosystem where it didn't belong and then took over. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, people, people love to move things around. That's an overlooked factor in invasive species. There, um, feral hit pigs were brought to Idaho because someone wanted to hunt them. And there's this idea like feral pigs are spreading unchecked across the country, but what's overlooked is they're being assisted by humans who then make the argument that we have to control them. It's a, a very bizarre uh, situation. And so, um, you know, one thing I noticed when I was researching my book, I went fishing in a lot of really gnarly places, but I call it the Goldilocks phenomenon. So if the water is not too hot and not too cold year round, whatever the scenario. So if it's a hot spring where those conditions are met, an urban river in say Phoenix or Miami or Los Angeles, you will have tropical fish. I found there is a warm water spring in the middle of the Idaho wilderness. It had African cichlids living in it. So oh. what that tells me is people dump their fish like crazy. And most of the time it's too cold, gets too cold and the fish don't make it. But boy, if there's warm water, people have dumped their fish in it and you will find exotic fish there. Yeah, that's crazy. I did a lot of research because I was writing something about how uh, some invasive birds got here, like the house sparrow. And when you're talking about human assistance, a lot of the stuff like the starlings and house sparrows came over because acclimatization societies back when America was being co uh, colonized were saying, we want familiar species. So we're going to bring them over and hope that they propagate, which is such a crazy thought in this time, of course. Um, just to think that they would have ever brought over European starlings and house sparrows and said, this is a great idea. 
Yeah, like the, it's amazing. No one could see the the potential. Um, and you know, even house finches, they are a North American native, but they were brought to New York and called Hollywood finches. That's what they were marketed as. And then the people set them free. And now, you know, they then recolonize much of North America and people consider them, you know, they, they like them better than sparrows, I think because they're prettier, but the reality is they aren't, you know, they're native to the continent, but they're much wider ranging. Yeah, and branching off um, the role of people, let's talk about that in a little bit more positive sense. Uh, how do you feel about the role of citizen scientists in bird conservation, especially with eBird kind of booming um, and becoming an important part of like most birders' lives? Yeah, well, when I said that, you know, birders are among outdoor recreationists, the most committed conservationists, I mean, part of it is the contributions to citizen science. I mean, really documenting birds uh, deeply in many different ways. You know, Project Feeder Watch, the Great Backyard Bird Count, Christmas Bird Counts, eBird, like the list goes on. And when you take all that data, it forms this picture of birds that you simply would not be able to get any other way. I mean, not a single researcher could never do that, right? And so it's documented the spread of invasive species, the contractions of range, you know, birds like the Carolina wren that are kind of expanding and contracting and then expanding a little more as the winters get warmer. And so um, it's allowed research by conservation organizations, by academics to compile this picture of bird conservation in North America and beyond, you know, it's really spreading. Um, and with it, with it being so effective for birds, I was thinking about why it hasn't, like something like that hasn't been effective for fish. And I feel like part of it is fishermen hate revealing where they catch their like favorite species. <laughs> but do you think that'd be possible with other species like the way it is for birds? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I'm seeing more and more on iNaturalist, like people recording their sightings. And sometimes with fishing, if you look, like they kind of fudge the location a little. It's like in a field, but you can kind of figure out it was at a pond. But that aside, in some ways, it's the same reason birding is a popular hobby, is the same reason birding lends itself to citizen science. And that's because birds are charismatic and they're visible. So I, I do keep a list of mammals seen and I, I love looking for mammals. I know, you know several of the people have seen more mammals than anyone, but as you spend more time looking for mammals, as much as I don't wanna admit this, you see why it hasn't caught on like birding. And that's partly because if you really dedicate yourself to a mammal lifeless, you spend a lot of time on bats. <laughs> and identifying bats is really hard. Like you pretty much have to go with a researcher with a mist net. And, and I have a friend who will spend a week in the rainforest with researchers in a mist net, but that's kind of where I draw the line. I mean, that's an acquired taste. <laughs> you know, that's, that's That must be like the, um, in the birder version of that is gulling at the landfill. Yeah, <laughs> trying to right. pick the ball, different cycles of golf. Is it bad right. that bats or bat and mist netting thing sounds really appealing to me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and, and like there are a lot of small rodents, there are a lot of nocturnal species. And so, um, you know, I, I uh, my colleague with Cool Green Science, uh, Justine Hauser, wrote a piece earlier this year about starting a yard list as a you know COVID activity. And I thought, well, I can do that. And so I've seen 47 birds in my, in my yard without binoculars. So since the quarantine started. Um, so think of another class of wildlife, you know, another grouping of wildlife that you could do that. I mean, 
I'm not going to see 47 mammals in my yard in my life. It's actually impossible. Not herps. Um, maybe like, you know, there's some things like moths, but then you get into moths and they're like 100,000 species. So you get overwhelmed. So birds are in a way perfect to watch. You can see many of them, you know, just walking around a city park, a national wildlife refuge. And really, it, I mean, if you have binoculars, that's really all you need. And a lot of times you can even do it without that, them. And so that lends itself not only as a hobby, but also to making contributions to science because literally anyone can do it. And you can, you know, anyone can go to a city park or a vacant lot and, and note what they see and observe birds going about their daily life. I, I have a story coming up about these two retired British guys who like ask around, like what's a bird that really hasn't been studied? And so they learned it was the ring ouzel. And so they went out weekly for 20 years and recorded what they saw ring ouzels doing. <laughs> and they, they say they were amateurs, but they actually contributed to the literature. They also called it deep birding. So instead of seeing how many they could see, they could see how deep they could get into this one bird's life. But that's available with birds. It's a really cool thing. I mean, you even with birds, you know, likely around you in an urban or suburban or agricultural area, there are observations that you can make that would likely contribute to science and conservation. Yeah, definitely. I think the, um, like you're saying, the accessibility um, really makes it something that everyone can enjoy. And uh, Ryan and I have been talking about this for a while, the COVID impact on birding. So many more people are getting out and doing it. Like we've met a number of different people like at Horicon Marsh, just general birding places where people are like, yeah, I started because of COVID and now like I'm hooked on it. There was a guy we met who like his wife came and gave him a big hug because he saw like a black crowned night heron for the first time mm -hmm. or something. Um, but do you think that we're going to get a new generation of like COVID birders? And do you think that I'm assuming that that'd probably be a positive thing, but you also see the negatives with some of the parks being overrun. So do you think we'll get more positives or negatives out of it? I, I think there's a real trend towards birding for all those reasons. And um, I, I think many people are connecting with nature. Will that stick? Um, I, you know, I suspect there will be some drop off, but it, it's kind of like the Carolina Wren's range. Like, you know, when it gets cold, they go south, but they don't go quite as far south as they were. So I think when, you know, people can go to spectator sports and concerts again, we'll lose some participants, but I, I think there will still be a net gain there. Yeah, I'd like to think then you have the people like picking out the like black rail at Wrigley, Wrigley Field or whatever story there was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think people will notice birds more. And also that one of the nice things about birding is that you can do it while you're doing other things, right? Like my yard list really is when I'm going about, you know, mowing the lawn feeding our backyard chickens, you know, playing with my son in the backyard. And, uh, you know, you just notice the birds. And once you start getting in the habit, you know, they're everywhere, right? <laughs> so. I feel like there's a lot of people that you encounter to that wouldn't at all be considered birders, but they all have some story about someone they know who is a birder or who feeds birds or they saw an eagle the other day. I remember one time Derek and I were going up to Door County in Wisconsin and we ran into somebody at a gas station who asked us what we were doing and we said we were going to look for an owl and he told us this long story about how he got attacked by a mob of owls at some point in his life or something. So it's almost <laughs> like whatever you do and whoever you run into, you have some sort of weird bird connection or they can come up with a connection. Yeah, it's definitely become more visible. You know, I, you know and there have been, you know, like there was the big year, a hollow Hollywood movie. And there's still this portrayal a lot of times as birders being a specific way. Yeah, you know, like kind of uber nerdy and, 
Yeah, but uh, but yeah, I, I think it's definitely becoming more visible, especially among younger people. Yeah, we've, we've kind of noticed that that trend too and kind of the different ways that younger birders do things versus older birders. Well, they'll still pull out their like paper list and some of them don't trust eBird to record their sightings. And we don't even use binoculars um, when we go out. We just use like a digital camera because we wanted to be able to take pictures of stuff because we were younger. People would always be like, oh, did you really see that? We'd be like, yeah, here's a picture of it. So there's definitely a, a new generation of younger birders. Um, that being said, as far as the conservation issues and citizen science's role, do you think there's anything that people really aren't doing now that they can do to help save some of the species that are in decline? Is it more about protecting habitat, more about um, getting uh, information out there to people who don't know? What are some things we should focus on? Yeah, I mean, I, I think habitat protection is significant in finding ways to protect all kinds of habitat. And also, you know, I, I say that conservation to this point, it has often been about protecting where the wild things are. And what we need to be thinking about is where the wild things will be, because that is shifting due to climate change. And so there are some, you know, really unique mapping um, programs that the Nature Conservancy is looking at right now as to how ranges will shift and what habitats are going to be resilient in the long haul. And looking at those, and before, you know, many of these sites now are not on conservationist radar. So now's the time to be, to look towards protecting them. So that, that's a significant one. And then Another one is just recognizing that there are little things we could be doing that can have big impacts, like um, not letting your cat roam outside is a big one. And also recognizing the severity of the threat. So, you know, wind energy is often um, promoted as this huge killer of birds. You know, it's a talking point in certain media. Like, oh, you know, it's slaughtering birds. But if you look at um, wind farms versus cats, there's no comparison at all. And so let's look at the severity of threats. And then like keeping a cat indoors is a pretty small step. You know, it's not asking someone to give up driving, for instance, right? You know, there are ways to design buildings so that birds don't run into them we should be doing that. It doesn't affect anyone's quality of life and it may not even cost more. So looking at these ways that we can help birds, you know, right now um, without really trade-offs. Yeah, Ryan and I, we came to that exact conclusion. We were reading an article about, they found painting one of the blades on a wind turbine black reduced bird deaths and uh, the wind energy. And we were like, oh, it's great. It saved this many birds. And then we looked at the bird deaths by cat and it was this like astronomical number in comparison. But I feel like it's also the like what the threat looks like because to people a wind turbine is like, oh, it's this big like mechanical thing. And with cats, people are like, oh, but it's so cute. It wants to go outside. It's like, you know, it doesn't matter. You got to keep your cat indoors. Yeah, that's a yeah. good point. <laughs> Uh, Matt, I was wondering, is there any species, either avian or otherwise, that has made a surprising adjustment to changes in its habitat? Like something that you've encountered that you would never have thought would have been able to survive as well as it does, maybe moving to an urban environment or dealing with habitat loss? Well, if, if you go back to when I was a kid, um, when I was growing up, I learned that turkeys needed wilderness. Um, in fact, when my dad and I first saw wild turkeys on some woodlands in central Pennsylvania where I grew up, uh, my classmates didn't believe me. They thought that I saw someone's chickens who had escaped. And now we can, would consider that crazy because turkeys have just taken off and they've taken over suburbs. You know, they aren't wilderness birds at all. They just needed some regulation and some forests. Right, and they do quite well. 
um, a mammal like that is the fisher. It's like this large weasel. Also learned that they needed wilderness to survive. Turns out when they were reintroduced to the Northeast, they're thriving. Um, all they need is for people not to kill them. It's a, as simple as that. Crazy um, how that works. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, a, and a lot of times, sometimes we do overthink that. Like it, it is that simple. Like, you know, there are still pe species being, you know, killed at too high of level. And that's what's doing them in. And sometimes, you know, in some countries, some continents, that's a really thorny problem. Um, in, in other areas, it's really quite simple. You know, like in the United States, we have fishing game departments that pass regulations. So they reintroduce fishers, protect them for a few years, and they take off. I know um, one of the articles you you one of the articles you've written was about bow fishing and how it can have negative impacts, of course, on species like gar and buffalo and things like that. Is there any um, bird species that is being hunted that you think should be regulated differently or that we shouldn't be hunting? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. I, so I would say, here's one that I know locally and it's not legal, but long-billed curlews near my home in Idaho have declined 90% in the last decade. And for a while, people were saying, oh, it's because of cheatgrass coming in, which is a non-native weed. It's, you know, the development that Boise, Idaho is experiencing. Turns out that people are target shooting them. And so they go out to shoot ground squirrels and they see a long-billed curlew out there and they're shooting it. And that one, it's, you know, completely, there's no justification for that whatsoever. It's wasteful and it's decimating these birds. And we, I mean, we have to, um, one, regulate that, but hunters have to speak up and say, this isn't okay. I mean, I, I'm a hunter, but um, a lot of times I see in hunting magazines, oh, hunters are the best conservationists. Well, if you're allowing that to happen, you can't claim that. I don't care if you buy a duck stamp. You're allowing people to go out and do that. And it just simply has to stop. And it's an easy thing that we could be doing, right? There's no reason that this has to happen. It's wasteful, cruel, and you know, there, there's no purpose to it. And so that, that's an easy one. I feel For like sure. a lot of it does kind of rely on individual consciousness basically, because I mean, I'm sure there's hunters out there that are very strict by the rules, would never do anything against what they know they're supposed to be doing. I'm sure there's hunters out there that just don't care. I'm sure it's the same with every group though, like birders too. I'm sure there's birders that are very careful with what they do. And then birders that will get too close to an owl or flush certain species, go into protected areas and not really treat them with the most respect. So I mean, I think on some level, it kind of depends on can enough people be reached to almost drown out the ones that can't be reached. Yeah, I, I think peer pressure can play a role in establishing those norms. And you know, there are a lot of regulations, many of them decades old, that hunters and anglers accept. I would just like to see that net broadened. And so in this case of the curlews, what I would say is that shooting ground squirrels for target practice on public lands does not have a justification. And so um, it's just because that's what people do, right? And they aren't really, I don't think, even thinking about, about it. But in the 21st century, there really isn't a justification for that. They're not eating them. And it's not sustainable if they're shooting long-billed curlews and burrowing owls and rattlesnakes and anything else they see. Um, similar to bow fishing. I mean, bow fishing for carp, an invasive species, no problem. Bow fishing for buffalo, a native fish that lives 100 years, 
doesn't reach reproductive maturity until it's quite old, um, that can't be justified. You kill too many of those fish, you're gonna wipe out the population. Yeah, I'd agree 100% on, on all that. Um, well, we're about, uh, our time's about up, but uh, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us, Matt, and we will make sure to put a link to the blog in the description so people can check it out. Um, any closing thoughts? No, I, I really appreciate what, what you're doing. And you know, I, I hope people do get out and what, however they enjoy the outdoors, record what they're seeing out there because it does help conservation. It adds to this body of knowledge that we have about wildlife that can show what those trends are. And that in itself can make a huge difference. Definitely. Well, thanks so much, Matt. Uh, if you make it out to Louisiana, we'll have to do some birding for sure. And I'm sure you'll get out to do some gar stuff too. Absolutely. Look forward to it. Thanks cool. so much for having me.